It is uh, great to see everyone, uh, guests of our family, glad you are here to join us, honored guests. Uh, it has been a great, great week for, for me as well. Not without uh, some difficulties and some struggles, but um, the, the elders uh, went away on an elder retreat. And it was a, a blessed time of prayer and discussion and getting to know one another more, uh, more deeply. And uh, we set aside, a lot, kind of last minute, a couple of, uh, couple of minutes to go play some basketball in the gym that was there at the uh, area where we were staying. And it's a good thing we only set aside a couple of minutes because all of us about ended up in the emergency room. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Uh, it was a, it was awesome. We're all limping today, though. Um, our message this morning is the joy of Jesus. I, uh, if you're uh, a believer that is struggling, or if you are a guest with us and you want to know what makes the Rockaway Community Church, uh, which is the people that are here, what makes us tick, it is our pursuit of joy in Jesus Christ. Um, we talk about sin and judgment and the wrath of God, but in the context of that, Jesus has rescued us from those things. Amen. The joy that we have isn't a joy of minimizing the difficult uh, sayings of Jesus and how God has revealed himself in Christ, but that we have a context to, for now to walk in the joy that we have, that we have been given all of the blessings that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So because Jesus is who he is, we have joy because he's purchased those things for us. So uh, I love the songs that were picked this morning uh, because obviously it's Advent season and we are to take, just bore down and take a, a deep look at who Jesus is in the Gospel of John that we might be reminded of the joy that he is for us. So. Let's ask God's blessing to speak to us this morning. Gracious Father, Sovereign Lord, what an amazing thing for you to leave to us a time every year to remember that you gave your Son because you loved the world. That you gave your Son to give us a perfection that we could never walk in, never earn, to remove the debt of our sin by your death on the cross in Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would align us with the blessings that are in Jesus, that you would remind us that you are good and right in all of your ways. So therefore, we ask for you to do what only you are able to do, that is open our ears, renew our minds, and give us hearts to love you and to love you more than anything else for you alone are worthy. We thank you and we praise you in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude. A great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her, her immorality. And he has avenged the, the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. 
And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like a voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given her, given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not revelations of Jesus Christ, but the revelation of Jesus Christ from which I just read. Both contain a wedding feast. Both contain a bride. Both contain a bridegroom. Both books have Jesus at a wedding feast. But the second book has Jesus as the bridegroom. Pause for a moment and think about what weddings signify. Think about the union of two into one. Think about the, uh, the anticipation of their new life together, their happiness, their love for one another. But the underlying and dominant tone of weddings is joy. You can almost smell it in the air when you attend a wedding. You look around the room and you can see it on people's faces. Those in attendance seem to forget about all of the troubles and cares in the world. And they join in the newlyweds in their celebration for one another. There is a gladness of heart that fuels that event. Jewish weddings are no different, of course. Ancient Jewish weddings would last for several days. The betrothal period would last up to a year prior to the marriage. And that would build in its anticipation leading to the wedding time. Our text this morning has us at a wedding in which Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with Jesus and his disciples were in attendance. Verses one and two. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Well, right out of the gate, we see that this wedding is on the third day, which begs the question, the third day from what? Now, remember, I've said in previous sermons that the content of the gospel narrative is obviously important. But in addition to that, the content is not the only thing that is important, but the placement of that content also has importance. John is purposefully placing the story of this wedding at the end of Jesus' last interaction that we looked at last week, the end of chapter one. But he also places it before the cleansing of the temple which completes chapter two, which we'll look at next week, Lord willing. So the third day from what? Jesus's conversation with Nathanael at the end of chapter one, starting in verse 49. Let me read that for you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I say to, said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, 
you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So you can see, before there were chapter and verse divisions, the text would flow right on into chapter 2. And in John chapter 21, verse 2, we'll learn later in this book that Nathaniel's home is where? Cana. Nathaniel's from Cana. That's where this wedding is taking place. It's about a three-hour journey from Jerusalem, on foot, anyway. So we are beginning to see these greater things just mentioned, but more on that later. Because something awful has happened at this wedding. Verse 3. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, the text doesn't say that many were even aware of this. Uh, they might have been. It doesn't really say. Uh, perhaps they were just, you know, standing around waiting for the next shipment of wine in a box from Costco. I don't know. It doesn't say. So we don't know. We, we need to be careful about inserting things into the text. We can speculate. Uh, what we know is that Mary let Jesus know, suggesting that, that she at least knew what was going on in the back. Uh, we aren't told why it happened, only that it did. It, it might have been from the great number of guests that were in, in attendance of the wedding. Uh, it might have been because of the meager means of the family that was hosting the wedding, or maybe both, but we don't know. What we do know is that this would have brought, now this is extra biblical, what this would have brought, brought a great deal of shame to the bridegroom who was responsible for the provisions of the wedding. So, Jesus responds to Mary's request, verse 4. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Now this literally reads from the Greek text like this. And Jesus saying to her, What to me and to you, woman? My hour is not yet. First off, we need to, I need to address something. Jesus referring to his mother as woman is not disrespectful, but actually the contrary. Uh, Jesus addresses her in the same way at his crucifixion, calling her woman. Now in our culture, this would be sound blunt and rude as, as it does, but not so in that culture. He is addressing her respectfully. And the little idiom here, what to me and to you. It's an interesting phrase, what to me and to you. In this context, it is a way of communicating disengagement. It's like saying, that's your business. What, why is that my business? He also uses this phrase, my hour has not yet come. Now, people are divided on what that means. But uh, here's what is clear from the text. Jesus' timing and people's expectations of that timing, whether it be in faith or even in their unbelief, they don't, usually don't match up. Let me give you an example from John chapter 7. After these things, this is John 7, 1 to 5. Listen carefully. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here. And go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. Did you catch that? the timings and the methods that they were wanting Jesus to do, John says, 
was an expression of their unbelief. Jesus, you're this great person. Go show yourself to the world. Don't keep it in secret. And John says that was their unbelief. Jesus does not operate like any other person. He cannot be manipulated by people. And he certainly won't meet our expectations if our expectations are rooted in the wrong desires. The Bible reads like no other book because it reads us. Now back to our wedding in Cana. Apparently, seeing that Jesus was about to respond anyway, his, his mother responds, verse five. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That's underlined in my Bible, by the way. Oh, think about how much joy we would have if, he would, if we would give heed to Mary's instruction. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. See, I, I think what drives the endless lines of questioning is not necessarily an attempt to parse out loving God and loving people, but I think it's actually an unwillingness to do what Jesus says. As a pastor once says, once said, it is unwise to complicate what Jesus has made simple. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. And if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Read the commands of Jesus and do them. Period. Verses 6 to 8. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. So there's several things we can learn from this section. First, when Jesus tells us to do something, say, like, love one another, make disciples, we are to hear his voice and obey him. We aren't to be fixated on the expectations or the results. That, that's not the point. See, these men had no clue what was about to happen. He doesn't, he doesn't tell them what he's doing. He just tells them to do this, and they do it. Second, Jesus doesn't make a big display in showing his power. The text doesn't say that he even got up from where he was reclining. The miracle was performed quite discreetly as the, as the servants obeyed the words of Jesus. So remember, the miracle of God working in you and in our church and, he, and Jesus building his church from the lost people of this world is often done in a quiet and humble way. And that is done as his servants obey his voice. Now... <laughs> I always feel led to say something like this. Contrast that with the, with the charlatans that are on TV and trying to put Jesus' name on it. I've spent more time undoing the junk that those guys dole out onto our culture, trying to communicate the purity of the gospel message. Don't think that the enemy does not work in those ways and try to put Jesus' label on it. Verse 9. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, 
But when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now there is some great, great, amazing stuff here in the form of allegory. Now, I don't believe because some allegorical things exist within the text that we should allegorize it to death so that it, eventually this beautiful story that involves Jesus ends up dying a, a death of a thousand allegories. There has been people within history, commentators mainly, that have done this, and it's ridiculous to be honest with you. But we shouldn't ignore the clear allegories that are here just to attempt to avoid the abuses. Number one, it is alluded to from the presence of the water pots of purification that those who drink from these pots at the wedding feast that Jesus is at are cleansed. They're purified. That points us to him at the great and final wedding feast in which we will see, be seated with him at that. Number two, Wine is a biblical symbol of joy and gladness of heart. But the wine ran out. The joy is departed. The bridegroom was set up to be covered in shame that his guests would have certainly heaped upon him. But as is the modus operandi of our Savior, he works and moves discreetly to remove the shame of the bridegroom and give him joy. J.C. Ryle says, true religion was never meant to make men melancholy. If you're attempting to obey the law of God to make yourself right with God, remember, Moses, who represented the law, he turned the water into what? Blood. But Christ turns the water from purification into wine, and that communicates purity and joy, and we want that. Number three, the text begins with the words, on the third day. On the third day, after Jesus told Nathanael that he would see greater things and see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Verse 11 tells us that this was just the beginning of the signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He did much, much more. But ultimately, this was pointing us. This was pointing us to three years later outside of the city of Jerusalem in which Jesus was raised on the third day after giving himself as a sin-absorbing sacrifice, we saw the greatest thing. We saw the greatest thing as himself, he reveals himself to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He would be the only ladder and is the only ladder in which men get to God through faith in him. So, in light of all of that, I've, I've attempted to set before you a table of joy. Of joy. If that sounds foreign to you, perhaps other preachers have lied. Perhaps they've lied that that a pursuit of God is not a pursuit of joy because this is what Jesus brings to us is purity and joy. So what do we do? What do we do in light of that? Well, in our culture, what we have is we have these things that are, that are set before us, kind of pseudo happiness and joy. Uh, they wear off quickly. And I'm not, I'm not being legalistic here, but I would say there are things that some of us absolutely need to set aside because they're distractions. Because we don't come to Jesus for joy. Some of us, at least in a, in a post-industrial, very modern society now where uh, devices are cheap, I'd, I'd say for a lot of us, those are purely distractions. 
where we can't even find time to budget to seek him. Some of us need to turn off our TVs, our computers, our tablets, our smartphones, on and on and on, because, because we're finding some degree of joy in those things, and yet we need to, to sometimes just stop and open our Bibles and say, Lord Jesus, I don't, even, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know that what this joy is that I hear about. I want that. I'm willing to set aside something, anything, whatever that is in your life, because I want you. I want the reward that you have. I want this joy. I want this purity. That is coming to him in faith, not being driven by our gut because sometimes we aren't feeling that. We, we don't feel the desire that we know we should have for Jesus. So we come to him and say, I know by faith that you will give me this and it's I know alone found in you. And that is sometimes an un-American thing to do because you know what? We are taught to follow our gut. The Apostle Paul says, of those that were lost in his day, that they followed their stomach. And this is a sermon to me, and I'm sharing it with you. Open the Bible and seek him. Seek him. He is our joy. And by the way, if you have a problem with miracles, remember the foundation that John has laid before us in the prologue. Jesus is God incarnate. If you miss any of those messages, Bill and his ministry to us and the surrounding community has those up on our website, they're on our Facebook page. Look at how John has laid a foundation for who Jesus is. He is the word who is God, who became flesh and dwelt among us. It's no big deal for God to do this. He establishes the order. He's the one that breaks the rules that he's set. He's communicating something to us by turning the water for purity to wine, and that's for us. It's no big deal for Jesus to do this. So when, for believers, when Jesus comes back, here's what we'll say. You have saved the best wine until now. That's what he's telling us. We will say, Lord, you have removed our shame. You've given us joy. And all praise and glory and honor are yours. Because he was the lamb slain for sinners. He doesn't give us joy in, an, in a vacuum. He purchases us the joy for us through his death. He's the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's the alpha and the omega. And that is our savior Jesus, he works to give us this joy. He gives us a certainty for eternity and a place at the table of the wedding feast of the Lamb. These are the things that we are to rejoice in. What an awesome Savior that we serve. And as we go out into the community, it's Advent season. It's the awesome time to say, you know what? There is a savior that has come, that's Christmas. And he has come to take away the sins of the world for anyone that will put their trust in him. That way Christmas is more than the Christmas depression that comes, that follows many, of, many people when they open their gifts and it's done for them. The gifts are open, the wrapping paper is in the burn pile and they are depressed because they don't know this savior. This is the savior that we serve and rejoice in. Might we share this bread of life to a hungry and dying world. <laughs>